This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Well, uh, Lee asked me to start with a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about, and it's the other solar power that most people aren't terribly aware of. Um, for a long time, the, the, uh, the earliest solar power technology for converting solar energy to electricity uh, that was deployed at any scale was actually making steam and running steam engines. Um, there's been solar thermal power around in various stages since uh, the late 19th century. And uh, from about the mid 80s onwards until just a few years ago, the vast majority of the world's solar electricity was here in California. There are 350 megawatts of solar thermal plants that were built in the 1980s that are still on the grid today and will probably be on the grid 20 years from now. Um, and yet, because solar thermal power tends to be large-scale centralized power plants, it's gotten much less sort of public awareness. Um, but if you care about solar power as a contributor to climate, um, solar thermal power, because it captures the sun's energy first as heat, can, and can therefore store energy in the form of heat, and can therefore provide reliable electricity with the same kind of characteristics as fossil-fired power, solar thermal power is a very important technology in the arsenal for weaning ourselves from fossil fuels. If you care about it simply from economic growth, um, a study a couple of years ago found that building solar thermal power plants delivers roughly four times the in-state jobs retained earnings and economic impact of conventional, conventional fossil fire generation. And just in terms of what the Silicon Valley investment community is paying attention to, some $800 million of investment has flowed into this sector in about the last 15 months um, with some of the usual suspects, Kleiner Perkins, Coastal Ventures, Vantage Point, and some new players, notably Chevron and Google, who have made some pretty big bets in this sector. So I'm going to provide kind of a, an overview of maybe briefly why it's important, what the main technologies are and their current status, and what the potential is here. Um, so stepping back, I think I hope everyone knows that electric power is the fastest growing part, portion of world energy use. In fact, IEA just this week released their new energy outlook for 2008, which is more aggressive than this, which says we're going to be using double the electricity that we use worldwide today by 2030. And of course, electricity, and, and if you, this uh, I, uh, EIA figure, the, the DOE EIA, suggests that most of that growth is taking place. China, India, Southeast Asia, Africa, the developing world. Um, and it's very tightly tied. It lifts people out of poverty, lifted this country out of poverty um, uh, in the 1930s. Rural electrification, large scale electric uh, uh, power cons construction projects. And at the same time, um, we have to ask where does that power come from and what are its not, what other impacts? Um, I don't know, how many people have seen this picture? A lot, yes. The coal industry is aggressively advertising. Uh, they have a slogan, clean coal, which um, doesn't actually have any content behind the words right now. But uh, roughly 50% of electric power in the United States comes from coal per megawatt hour, fleet average in the US, a megawatt hour of electric, pa electric power releases about 1,400 pounds of carbon dioxide. Gas-fired power, it's about 900 pounds. Coal-fired power plants are about 2,200 pounds, so about one ton of CO2 per megawatt hour. Um, and, uh, you know, electricity comes, the, the vast majority of our electricity comes from thermal power generation systems, where heat is turned into high pressure steam, which drives an engine, modern steam turbines. Um, that engine directly drives a generator, and you're tied to the grid. And critically, 
the efficiency of this engine is limited by the difference between the hot side temperature and the cold side temperature. So the colder you can make the steam condenser, the more energy you get out, or the hotter you can make the steam. On this side, with fossil plants, we're limited by metallurgy and the things the turbine is made of and, and the corrosiveness of very high temperature steam. On this side, um, uh, power generation in the United States uses half of all the water that we, that we uh, produce in our water systems as a means in cooling towers of cooling that cold side temperature lower than ambient air temperature. And uh, today in California, it's essentially impossible now to build a wet cooled power plant. 98% of the water used in power generation is right here in evaporating water in the cooling tower. The basic heat transfer fluid goes round and round, uses almost none. But a, uh, a dry cooled power plant, the cost of electricity is maybe eight or nine percent above that of a wet cooled power plant. So, you know, electricity, this heat is not the problem, right? It's the CO2 that's the problem. Ken Caldera points out that in its lifetime in the atmosphere, each molecule of CO2 traps 100,000 times more heat than was released during the combustion at the moment of its formation. So your 800 watt electric hairdryer powered by fleet average electricity contributes as much planetary heating as two 747s taking off, running at full takeoff power for the same time. They deliver the heat instantaneously. In this case, it's delivered over 50 years. But the, the factor of 100,000 is, of course, the problem. So uh, of course, we'd want to be choosing fuels that are lower carbon as a way of addressing that. But business as usual, in fact, the current EIA outlook suggests that the, the fuel that is going to power that doubling on electric power worldwide over the next dec uh, coming decades is all coal-fired power. And um, that's a problem, right? That's a problem because this is a slide of Jim Hansen's from a couple of years ago. In retrospect, even two years ago, he was a little optimistic about the business as usual case. Um, but the business as usual case takes us to very high levels of atmospheric carbon. And you'll see that the contribution of coal is the vast dominant portion of that. And um, recently, he's pointing out that um, I think everyone's heard of peak oil, that we must have peak coal. We must turn off coal-fired generation promptly. And we have to do a lot of other things as well if we're going to get in this century to a target that he's established as livable. I know there's a lot of question about exactly where that target is. But if we were to choose other fuels, what are our choices? So the world, you know, there's different estimates of world total energy use, but I'm taking 16 terawatt hours annually of energy use. Um, it, now these are, this is a slide of Dick Perez's from SUNY Albany. These are uh, relatively sized spheres. So here's world energy use. Here's how much total remaining coal there is in the world. This figure turns out to be wrong, but um, it's smaller than that. But nevertheless, here's the world remaining supply of uranium, the world remaining supply of oil and gas. So the consumable fuels can power humanity for a certain period. Well, let's look at the renewable resources that are available again every year. Now these spheres are annual usable energy, not the raw form, but what we might actually convert totally. If we used all the wind energy that could be converted, we might meet world energy use. There are storage and other problems. Ocean thermal energy conversion, if we used all the exploitable biomass, all the hydro, each of these could be a contributor, but um, solar is vastly larger. And this is only solar power falling on land where 65 percent's been deducted for clouds and atmospheric effect. This is the solar that we can tap readily with whatever technology we have available. So, you know, it's very obviously clear that the first place to look for technologies to solve this problem is here. I think everyone's familiar with the work that's going on with photovoltaic solar. And I just want to talk about solar thermal. Solar thermal, 
recently won an all-source RFP in Arizona that was not driven by a requirement for renewable energy. Arizona Public Service is building a 280 megawatt solar thermal power plant because they decided that the risk to ratepayers for future costs, it's cheaper than gas in Arizona. There are certain places in the world where the plants are economical. Um, our outlook at OSRA, when we were doing analysis there, suggests that with a policy on costs for carbon emissions uh, that's in a range that people are talking about, $30 a ton, solar thermal is cheaper than all the alternatives. We'll come back to that. Um, solar thermal can deliver the vast majority of total grid energy because storage is a part of these solar thermal systems. We'll come back to that as well. And there's work underway today. There is, there's been some 4,000 megawatts of power purchase agreements signed in the United States, mostly by utilities in California, also Arizona and Nevada. Um, and a fundamental thing happened about a month ago. A month ago, on the 10th attempt in the United States Senate, uh, we made law an eight-year extension of the 30% investment tax credit for solar power which means now for the first time in American history, we have an eight year period of stable tax policy for the private sector to invest and build plants. Um, Senator Reid del still deserves a ticker tape parade. He introduced the legislation 10 times. It passed only when he included the provisions in the must pass bank bailout bill, the <laughs> ESA. And both senators from Arizona, by the way, voted no nine times. They only voted yes in the must-pass bill. Um, as we'll see, land is not an issue either. So uh, this slide's got a lot of information on it. Pardon me for just presenting it all at once. The black curve here is a typical July day in California. At 3 in the morning, California is using 20 gigawatts of power. 3 in the afternoon, California is using about 60 gigawatts. And that peak hour energy goes on until 8 or 9 p.m. And when you flip the lights on, pretty much anywhere in the US, you're buying a blend of different fuels um, that's made up of so-called baseload generators that have high construction cost per kilowatt, but low marginal fuel cost. Those are the things that we try to run 100% of the time. And intermediate and peaking plants, the peaking plants don't run very many hours of the year. Um, Utilities are required, of course, to maintain generating capacity that's enough above the peak hour demand that we don't have brownouts or blackouts on a regular basis. The, one of the unfortunate things that, that's going on in the United States annually, peak summer load is growing twice as fast annually as average electricity load. Year to year, this page is getting stretched vertically. And that means that the fastest growing portion of our energy demand is being met by the plants that have the worst fuel economy and the highest cost per kilowatt hour. Essentially, 100% of this is fired by natural gas. Um, the modern plants are all jet engines. They're gas turbine engines. Um, uh, these intermediate plants are more fuel efficient. A lot, of, a lot of this was built in the last decade in the United States. We'll come back and look at a history. So on the same chart then is as available solar radiation on that particular day in July. Um, there were a couple of plat passing clouds, but we start getting sunshine at, at 6.30 in the morning. It's gone by 5.30. This slide will tell you, among other things, that the notion that photovoltaic solar by itself, without energy storage, can somehow reduce load on the grid that notion is incorrect because peak hour demand extends until 8 p.m. and it is the peak demand that puts the strain on the grid. Solar, all forms of solar deliver energy when it's most valuable, but without storage, the, the maximum number of conventional power plants we need doesn't change. As I mentioned, solar thermal power has been around for a long time. An American engineer named Frank Schumann uh, from Philadelphia built a plant in Maadi, Egypt. Um, the way this plant operates is there are these trough-shaped reflectors 
all the sunlight that falls on these troughs is reflected on a, onto a tube that runs down the middle, and that's where the water boils and forms high-pressure steam, in this case running a, a, a reciprocating steam engine, a 50 kilowatt generator, an air-cooled condenser, no water used in the desert, the cycle repeats. Um, this plant was online until during World War I, the British shut it down and replaced it with coal-fired power, with the coal imported from Newcastle. Um, and uh, solar has had a similar relationship with fossil-fired energy on and off. Um, in the modern era, um, most of what has been built is new generations of trough technology that was built uh, first in the 1980s. But there are really four, you can break down, there's a lot of activity, a lot of companies and research labs. It falls into four categories. Systems that focus light on a point and systems that focus light on a line. The things that focus light on a point have to track the sun in two dimensions. So all the mirror system has to move around. The things that focus light on a line um, only have to track the sun in one dimension. You use a very long line, you ignore the north-south thing because it becomes one or two percent effect. Um, and then the other axis is systems that use a continuous curved reflector or systems that use the reflector broken into segments, a Fresnel reflector. So we wind up with four types, and they wind up being called dish, tower, trough, and linear Fresnel. And your job as a designer of one of these things is to focus sunlight, concentrate it, and the, the low concentration systems are in the 50 to 70 times brighter than at fault. You know, you get one kilowatt of thermal energy per square meter at noon in sunny places in the world. It's about 1,300 watts out in space. The atmosphere filters out a little bit, and it filters out a lot in the mornings and the evenings. This air actually disperses some of the light. Um, but uh, the, the highest concentration systems run up to 3,000, even 5,000 times. Um, you would track the sun. Uh, many of these systems include energy storage so that the generator can run after sundown. Um, and then you're converting heat to power just like in a conventional thermal power system. And most of these things use the same turbine engines that are used in fossil-fired power plants. Um, there are gas turbines and steam turbines. Uh, some of these systems are also using Stirling engines for con converting heat to work. And the, the cost of power out of these systems is determined by, well, what do they cost to build? And um, how much energy do they deliver? And that breaks down into what's it cost per unit area for the collector? How efficient is the collector at gathering up sunlight and delivering it into the receiver? Um, do you lose any, any heat energy back? And then how much of the thermal how much of the heat turns into electricity? In a typical coal-fired power plant, uh, about 40% of the thermal energy that was released in burning coal goes out the wire as electricity. In solar plants, it can, it's ranges from the low 30s up to maybe 35, but um, with so-called combined cycle systems, you can get above 50% efficiency. And this is why chasing these four things is what's led to this profusion of, of different ideas. And as a developer, you're, you're struggling with two fundamentals. One is the, the same old engine efficiency that we talked about earlier, but the other is a solar heat absorber, a solar boiler, unlike a coal or a gas boiler, is not a closed room. And it's open, and so it radiates heat away from being hot, and in fact, the radiation loss goes as the surface area of the receiver times how well it approximates a black body radiator times a constant times the fourth power of its temperature. So the difference between something that runs at 300 C and 400 C can be you know, vastly larger thermal losses. Fourth power really goes very rapidly. So you'll see in the, in the point focus systems these things are trying to drive the area of the receiver down. And they wind up with tremendous material science challenges 
in how you expose something that's you know this big an area is absorbing a megawatt of light. Um, the line focus systems have been made possible by surfaces that in the infrared spectrum have low emissivity. So they're, they're fancy surfaces. So the, 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 that's the, the, a lot of the development is around those two things, is materials that can deal with extremely high concentration or materials that are very low thermal loss. Um, so just to name some of the companies that are out there, um, there's a company in Arizona called Sterling Energy Systems that's building these dishes, which stand about uh, 10 meters high. Um, there's a company in Washington State that's been building uh, Sterling engines for spacecraft that's now building Sterling dishes that are about one meter dishes. Um, there's a lot of tower companies now. Uh, Abengoa from Spain, Solar Reserve, I have a slide of theirs later. Um, Bright Source, which is split between Berkeley and Israel. Torre Sol, which is a Spanish company funded out of Abu Dhabi. Um, in the trough business, there's quite a lot of, tech, of developers and a smaller number of technology companies. Axiona is the most recent company in the United States to build a trough plant. They built a 64 megawatt trough plant outside Boulder City, Nevada. It's about 30 miles from Las Vegas. Definitely arrange to go see it if you go on a Hoover Dam tour. It's very close by. Um, Abengoa is building the 280 megawatt trough plant in Arizona that I mentioned. And this linear Fresnel system, um, OSRA's founder, David Mills, invented. There's some small European companies that are building other variations as well, but OSRA is the one that's building large-scale plants. And just to give you a sense of the, the thermal points that these things are operating at, so these things are, the, the dishes are trying to go to very high temperatures, and they're totally materials limited. There are people building dishes that run only at 650C because of the materials challenges. So this is, if you're a ceramicist or you're building, you know, extremely durable surfaces, this is where you want to focus. The systems today have Inconel alloy that came out of the inside of jet engines with hydrogen flowing as the heat transfer fluid. This very interesting exotica here. These tower systems um, today are all moving to about 550 C. And one group is using direct steam generating towers. The other is circulating uh, so-called molten salt that we'll talk more about later on as the heat transfer fluid. The troughs use oil today as the heat transfer fluid. They can't boil water directly because the receiver moves with the mirror to follow the sun, and so they're flexible hoses, so they can't hold high pressure. So they circulate an oil and then run that through a heat exchanger to boil water. Um, these linear Fresnel systems, because the receiver is fixed, are directly generating steam like some of the towers. Um, the tower idea is fairly simple, except for what happens at that one spot, right? We build heliostats, heli they're, they're called heliostats, these moving mirrors. They're essentially flat mirrors. All of their light falls on one point. Um, if you're a bird and you fly by that point, you are in very serious trouble. Uh, there is a tower in Spain that has some bird kill problems. Um, the, uh, the receiver uh, research, uh, in Spain and Israel and the United States are the main places that have been doing this research. Um, there are uh, receivers that boil water, that heat molten salt. Um, there are receivers that try to use a ceramic material and suck air through the ceramic. Um, one tower design idea, of which there is a prototype in Albuquerque at Sandia National Lab, um, tries to deal with the tremendous heat flux by absorbing energy in kind of a waterfall of sand particles that during the fraction of a second they fall through the window, heat 1,000 Fahrenheit, 500 C. And um, then you can store the sand as your energy storage system. Um, the best developed, perhaps, tower technology today was invented and prototyped down in Barstow, California in the Mojave Desert in the late 1980s a project called Solar One was then converted to Solar Two. The first one had a steam boiler. The second one, they replaced the steam boiler with 
a boiler with thinner tubes that circulated a mixture of potassium nitrate and sodium nitrate. It's the N when you buy garden fertilizer. It happens to melt at about 180 C, and it's completely um, inert up to about 600 C and very low vapor pressure. So it, it makes a very nice heat transfer fluid as long as you always keep it above 180 C. So you have a challenge as a plant designer to make sure that it never freezes because you will have serious problems. Other than that, um, this is a very promising technology. There's a company called uh, Solar Reserve that's spun out of um, uh, uh, United Technologies, Rocketdyne. Um, and this is, so the optical efficiency of the receiver, it was, was high. Because of the high solar concentration, its thermal losses were low. So 88% of the sunlight that hit that, they, the thermal energy went out in the salt. And uh, we'll talk about storage in a moment. Um, these are the two dish engine systems. I mentioned these are the roughly 10 meter dishes and the one meter dish. This is a 25 kilowatt Stirling engine. This is a little three kilowatt. So this is a small kind of rooftop system. Um, there's a very large power purchase agreement with Southern California Edison and San Diego Gas and Electric for systems of this type. Um, as I mentioned, the troughs are what we have most of in the world. Um, since the 1980s, there's been some 350 megawatts spread across several square miles, about three and a half square miles of the Mojave Desert, down very close to Edwards Air Force Base, you know, a town called Boron or Kramer Junction, California. Um, and they've been long-term reliable. Uh, you can get a sense of the scale of these things. The, the, the ref each reflector unit is about, uh, what is it? It's about three meters across, three and a half meters across. And um, uh, the entire thing moves to track the sun, and you put together lots of them to gather up enough energy to drive steam turbines, which are located at the center of these things. Um, OSRA just uh, opened this project, which is in Bakersfield. There's a few of these uh, linear Fresnel lines. Each of these is a quarter mile long. Um, it's about 33 meters wide. And OSRA has announced plans to build uh, 180 megawatt power plants uh, south of here in, in uh, San Luis Obispo County that occupies exactly one square mile. And I think has a hundred, and each one of these blue strips is uh, one of these collectors. Um, one of these guys is, each of these is one of the strips here with uh, two steam turbines and an air-cooled system. Um, again, as I mentioned, it's difficult to build wet-cooled power plants now. Um, uh, each of the systems, there are lots of ways of evaluating them. The, the linear Fresnel has the lowest cost of the solar field, but there's this ongoing, is it the, what do you work on hardest? Do you work on the efficiency? Do you work on the, the, the solar field cost? Everybody has their advocates. Um, I wanted to say two words about the, what I mentioned earlier, this fancy selective surface idea. Um, black carbon is a pretty good approximation of an ideal black body surface. It's very good at absorbing light, and it's very good at radiating heat as it heats up. Um, in a perfect world, what you'd want is the, you know, if we think about solar radiation at Earth's surface, this left-hand side of this curve from about 0.2 to 5 microns is where you get sunshine in those wavelengths. In a perfect world, what you'd like is an absorbing material that in those wavelengths looks like black carbon, but in the infrared wavelengths, because this object is heating up to maybe 800K instead of 4800K solar temperatures, you'd like it to look like a polished reflector so that it's, it's not good at absorbing heat and it's also not good at radiating heat. And um, a guy named uh, Harry Tabor, I think, invented the first of them. David Mills invented uh, one that's in wide use in most of the world's solar hot water heaters and in the troughs. And this is actually a manufacturing sample from the Chinese maker who makes water heaters. You can see there's an underlying um, sh polished copper layer, shiny copper layer, that's overlaid by a very thin absorber layer. 
and the thickness of the absorber layer and its ability to look black with very shallow depth is critical to this characteristic of approximating something that looks black in visible light. And this has been, the, the numbers are like 96% absorption and maybe 9% emittance in the infrared. So these selective surfaces have been quite successful in making linear focus systems cost effective. And otherwise, they'd, the, absor the absorber area would be too large and you'd have excessive thermal energy loss. Okay, so lastly, I think the last critical thing to talk about briefly is, is energy storage. As I mentioned, the, you know, one of the killer advantages of solar thermal generation is that instead of converting sunlight directly to electricity using the photoelectric effect, we thermalize photons and then we separately convert that heat energy into, into mechanical and electrical energy, so, which offers the opportunity to store energy in the form of heat. And it, it's an awful lot cheaper to, and more efficient to store energy as heat than electricity. My favorite desktop example is a laptop battery and a thermos of coffee. They store about the same amount of energy in two different forms, and one costs $5 and one costs like $100. Um, at scale, I think today you can buy the largest batteries for about $1,000 per kilowatt hour of storage capacity, and the thermal systems are in the $50 per kilowatt hour of storage capacity today. So there's a, a very big difference, and, and oddly enough, if you think about it, if, you, if your solar plant only runs during the daytime, your steam turbine doesn't run that many hours of the year, and the, the solar field, um, by, by building plants that include energy storage, the solar field cost goes up, you have the cost of the storage system, but the steam turbine and this whole stuff is amortized over more hours of generation. So plants with essentially no storage, plants with 12 hours of storage, have approximately the same cost of electricity per kilowatt hour. Now that's very distinct from any battery system which at least doubles the delivered price of electricity out of the battery. So um, uh, you know, people have pr been pursuing this molten, multiple materials for storing heat and using that heat storage to flatten out the generating profile. Now, um, and um, it allows us to build solar power plants that are operated as if they were gas-fired or coal-fired power plants. And without, an ex you know, without exotics that don't exist today, without anything made out of unobtainium, um, it's, all, it's all very pedestrian kind of technology. So um, there's a lot of research going on in thermal energy storage around the world. Um, not enough of it in the United States. Um, but if you look at all the systems that I just talked about, we have troughs and towers at, at different temperatures um, with different types of engines. It should be sort of obvious that there's not going to be a single material or storage approach that's going to be best for all of those. So, at, at, in particularly, different temperature regimes are going to drive different choices of material. Um, and there's a lot of different ideas. There are um, systems that use molten salt. I'll show you a little bit more example in a moment. There's systems that store energy in concrete or rock. There are phase change materials. You can imagine waxes or salts or other materials whose melting point is right where you want it. So as you're storing energy, you're melting it, and as, as it's releasing energy, it's freezing again and its melting point is maybe you know, 300 C or something. Um, these things store a lot of energy per kilogram. These things um, cost very little per kilogram. And you know, there are power plants where we're talking about kilotons of material that is heating up and cooling down daily because it only costs you know, single digit dollars per ton. Um, uh, and there's, so there's a lot of different ideas. The things that are currently in commercial stage are um, uh, a system that uh, uses a pressure vessel 
to let steam into a pressure vessel. It's stored as water. It flashes back out as steam and uh, hot and cold tanks of salt. Um, and uh, there's a, a tower project in Spain called PS10 that uh, has, I think, two hours of energy storage. Basically, saturated steam is admitted to this large vessel. Um, and during the day, the vessel fills up with very hot water. When you crack open the outlet valve, it flash boils and continues operating the turbine. So the inlet temperature might be 260 C, the outlet temperature like 250. You get about 93% of the exergy, the work capability of energy, out of the storage system that you put in. And you only lose about 1% a day. These tanks or vessels are large enough that their surface area is small compared to their volume. You, you insulate them, but it's not a big deal. You'd think that thermal losses are the problem. They're not. The things that really drive the cost here are the cost of the vessel because it has to handle high pressures and any kind of valves, things like that. The other system that is in uh, wide use, there's one power plant on the grid in Spain today. It's called Andesol One. There are five more of them in development and in construction. Um, Andesol is now on the grid, and in the summer months, it operates 24 hours a day. Um, and it has a cold tank and a hot tank. The cold tank is still warm enough that it might hurt you. Um, and the salt, when it's, when it's uh, in molten, is transparent. It looks like water. There's all kinds of very interesting safety issues working around it. But it's non-toxic. Other than burning you, it won't hurt you. Um, and basically, during the day, solar energy is used to heat the salt from 292 up to 390. And you pump from one tank to the other during the day. And at night, you're running through a heat exchanger. You're generating steam off the energy in this tank and putting it back in the cold tank. So that daily you've got, so that this is your heat battery. And you can generate from this heat battery as you want. Um, so that, in particular, you can cover all these peak hours of generation. As I mentioned earlier, this is a slide from Arizona Public Service. They've, they're building a project called Solana in Arizona that's a 280 megawatt project. I think it has seven hours of storage, 41% capacity factor. Um, from their standpoint, that plant will be on 95% of their peak hours of the year. And that's what made it economical, because peak electricity is the most expensive electricity and the one that is subject to the greatest fuel uncertainty. McKinsey, Simmons, Cambridge Energy Research are all talking about a doubling in natural gas prices within the next five or six years. Now, depends on how deep our economic recession is, that, may, that number may move out. But there are, we've had rapid increases in our domestic use of gas and We've had some fines, but they're far from making us independent on gas. Um, in California, the utilities from noon to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday pay roughly twice per kilowatt hour what um, they do in the other hours. So as a generator, if you have energy storage, you have a strong incentive not to run your turbine in the morning, but to hang on to the energy as heat and release it sometime afternoon and get paid more for it. And that reduces their avoid, that's their price structure reflects their cost structure. There are other places where there is no time of day delivery, so that flat generating 24 hour profile in the first storage slide might be the right one. So it, it's an economic dis, uh, decision at each place. A surprising finding though, so given all of this and given what I said earlier that um, Electric, electricity price is roughly constant out to about 12 to 14 hours of energy storage. Um, uh, David Mills and Rob Morgan from Authra did a study looking at, asking the question, using least cost power plants with 14 hours of energy storage, what total portion of US grid energy could solar deliver? I think uh, most folks know that there's a a project to get to 20% wind energy by 2030. And asymptotically beyond that, grid integration costs for wind start rising very steeply. Storage is needed. 
wind is delivering energy at the wrong time. PV can also deliver another 20, 25% before grid energy uh, integration costs rise steeply. That curve doesn't occur until you get up to about 94% of total grid energy. That is, surprisingly, if you have the transmission infrastructure, solar thermal power alone can deliver the vast majority of grid energy annually. And the, the surprising thing is that, sure, solar power plants have a seasonal characteristic to their output, that there's more energy in the summer. So does our grid load. So the, the, um, uh, the blue is the Cal blue dots is California and Texas, um, where we had hour by hour data. Um, we and the green is what you'd get from minimally uh, minimal cost, so-called solar multiple three solar thermal plants. And um, if you arrange them so that you throw away very little energy, um, you, you wind up delivering over 90%, 5%. Against that, here's US grid power. The US has more of a winter peak, largely driven by heating loads in the Northwest and places where historically electricity was cheap. Most of our heating load is not on the grid, right? It's on natural gas. Um, and from an economic standpoint, now this is the slide when people start throwing tomatoes, perhaps. Um, but for every, you know, uh, Professor Wayant just sent me his models yesterday. I haven't had a chance to look at his. But with the same debt equity structure, the, roughly the same returns to equity, slightly higher returns to equity for nuclear and solar because they're uh, slightly riskier, and today's construction costs. So. Uh, $5,500 a kilowatt for nuclear, even though folks are now talking about, I think, $8,000 a kilowatt. Um, pulverized coal, $3,200 a kilowatt. Again, these numbers are up to $4,000. Um, today's price of gas, $9. Solar thermal um, is the lowest cost of all the fuels once you put a $30 ton, per ton cost on the coal plants. It beats gas without it. And as I mentioned, we already have an existence proof of Arizona Public Service buying a first plant um, on that premise. So uh, how much world energy could it deliver and where will the plants be? These are the, the locations where um, you get lots of sunshine during the day. And um, that is the amount of land that it would require to deliver all world electricity demand in 2030. I think I have that number right. I think it's 2030, it might be 2020. Land is not remotely a constraint, and um, you know, all the high solar regimes, all the high solar radiation locations are within reasonable transmission distance of the major load centers. Um, and you know, here in the United States, all of current US electric, electric power, day and night, take 10% of the BLM land in the state of Nevada. That's 100% of US electricity. Um, compared to some other options, ju just for fun, Mills did a comparison of annual energy yield per acre. Um, against corn ethanol, the, the ratio is 500 to 1. Against the best cellulosic ethanol, the annual energy yield is uh, 32 to 1. The algae is the best, ne the next best thing. I think it's only 16 times more land for the same energy. Um, the conversion efficiencies that we have today aren't as good as what we will have, but this is based on today's conversion efficiencies. Um, and we also have the transmission technologies today. Today, we move for 30 years, we've been moving hydropower from Washington and Oregon to LA over a 500 kilovolt DC line. Um, there are lots of long distance DC lines, D you know, at high voltage, that's commercial technology from everybody today, you can go 1,000 kilometers with 3% energy loss per 1,000 kilometers. So we can tie the country together to deliver all of our power from wind from the Midwest and solar from the Southwest at the lowest costs. There's a multi-country European initiative studying 
and actually starting to build some of the initial pieces to tie together Norwegian Hydro, North Sea Wind, and especially North African um, uh, large-scale solar. And um, there's a, a website, deserttech.org, which has vast amounts of information about that initiative. Here in the United States, lots of folks are talking about a superhighway that overlays the current grid. This slide is a bit of an eye chart. The image behind is where all the current power plants are. Every brown spot is a power plant. You can see the current transmission lines, like that's the, the DC line from, or, southern, from northern Oregon to LA, and there's one from Utah. There's some other DC lines you can see. Um, and the, the sketched in, you know, there's lots of ideas about where interstate electricity transmission is going to be. But we are at a moment, today in the United States, we do grid the way we did roads in 1939. And there's a lot of discussion about what it's going to do to the United States, that what interstate electricity is going to do to the country is what, very similar to what interstate highways did for the country. Um, I don't know if you've seen this ad that uh, the, the WE initiative has been running. You know, could we actually convert the grid over to renewables within 10 years? Well, this is a 50-year history of the American electric power industry on one slide. Rob Sokolow did this slide. It's a very nice visual. Uh, and each bar, the height, is how much new generation came on in that year. And the colors are by fuel. So the brown is coal and the Yellow is uh, uh, nuclear, and the blue is hydro, and the red is natural gas. And you can see the effect of all the rules changes, and you know, right about in here, the combined cycle power plant technology matured. We had you know, 60 cent to $2 gas. We, in I think 89, we changed the rules so you could use gas for power generation again. Then we restructured and created IPPs, and we built 25% of the US grid in less than 10 years. We were building 70-some gigawatts a year. This is pure private sector, market forces, no government policy involved other than getting out of the way. Um, you know, could we build, you know, China is currently building 100 gigawatts of thermal generation. Unfortunately, annually, it's currently all coal-fired. But there's no question that it, that it would be possible if there was the political will starting roughly three years from now to go, 10, 20, 40, 80 gigawatts a year. 10 years is hard unless there's a lot of wind component. 12 to 15 years is not from an execution standpoint. And um, so let me just stop. This is Dick Perez's, the latest version of his slide. This is a complete eye chart, but the, uh, the handout, the, I, the, the slides are available. And Dick's done a nice job of uh, providing the sources for every one of these fuel reserves. Um, so let me stop there. And I think we have a little time for questions. Hi, uh, what prevents you from scaling this down to being on a rooftop? The big issue is the same reason that prevents you from scaling a coal plant to fit in your basement, which is that the thermodynamic efficiency of the heat engines tends to be better with bigger ones. You know, if you think about stubbing, stubby wing airplanes don't fly very well. Gliders have very long wings. There's a reason why you want high aspect ratio blades in a steam turbine, which takes you, very large steam turbines are more fuel efficient. They're better at converting heat into work. And so it's really, it's a function of the engines, not the solar collectors. So now what about in your house though? You, would, you need the heat services, not the electricity? Yes, that's right. And combined heat and power is exactly the place where that might be valuable. And there's folks beginning to pursue that. Absolutely correct. And in fact, there are folks pursuing tri-generation using some of the waste heat for driving and absorption, chiller, and then domestic hot water. Um, so there are folks working at the smaller scale. But again, the, um, the, the cost of installing, you know, if you're positing you're going to install a square mile net of solar collectors, you're either going to do it all in one site on bare ground or you're going to do it on 5,000 roofs. Guaranteed, your installation costs will be three times higher on the roofs. So, you know, ultimately, economics drives our major energy infrastructure. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. On your transmission initiative, uh, I believe that it's important to be able to, to light the light of the city of New York with Arizona solar. But if you look at the way the grid is currently set up, 
They're not left transmission lines that are very big, that are regionalized. How, are you, how have you done any approximation of how many transmission lines and of what size it would take to go from the southwest to the northeast? Yeah, well, so that, um, there's, there's folks smarter than me who've been working on this, and there is actually uh, a lot of study out of the Western Governors Association and several other f uh, folks who've been looking at exactly this. Steve Chu from Lawrence Berkeley Labs has been talking about these issues for a while. Um, the, uh, these corridor widths are for constant energy transmission. There's a tremendous benefit from going to high voltages in DC, both in the corridor impact and um, in the last 15 years in this country, we have built 400 miles of interstate transmission lines and 14,000 miles of gas pipelines. 14,000? I think that's right. It's either 14,000 or 1,400. I think it's 14,000 miles of gas pipelines. We've built a vast gas pipeline network and put combined cycle gas power plants in cities. Um, so, you know, this, this boom right here, you know, we built a, a huge network of gas pipelines to serve those plants. Um, previously, we put power plants far away from population centers because of all their emissions. Um, and now that any renewables first agenda needs to put the wind generators where the wind is best, the solar power where the solar is best to get cost. Today, transmission is about 7% of the typical electric bill. So if that went up to 12% and you got a halving of the generation cost, it, economically it works. Yes? Um, so if we talk, start talking about putting a lot of solar plants in deserts, that puts a lot of our energy generating capacity in what seems like maybe a relatively small geographical area. So what happens if you have like cloudy days? How does that impact the whole well, grid overall? Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's also a great question. There's, there's two or three different answers to that. Let's go back and look at the uh, region. The short answer is I may not be able to get there quick enough. Um, the, uh, the high solar regime area of the US goes from maybe West Texas out to you know, ca Southern California. And uh, weather systems are different in different places. So there's spatial, there is spatial diversity. Um, the other thing about these systems that is actively being pursued right now is fossil co-firing. So that, and in fact, the plants that were built in the Mojave Desert had gas co-firing. And there was a brief period, which you didn't mention, Mount, when Mount Pinatubo went off, the solar output fell by about 15% for about a three-year period. And they burned more gas for a few years. And it's likely that as we get to high solar penetration, that's what we'll use gas for. And that's what we'll use fossil fuels for, is to do the little bit of uncertainty management. Yeah, yeah you, you mentioned that there were a number of things which the market itself drove, and then you also were very pleased that there was a renewable tax credit. So if, if Obama's transition team called you up and said, what are the incentives that we need to try to push the technology development and bring the cost down fastest, what are the right public-private partnerships to create incentives, well, what would you tell them and how long would you tell them it would take us to do the job? Okay, so that, that's an excellent question. That's really the heart of what we ought to do next. The biggest issue that, that all these, all solar systems face is cost of capital. And um, the challenge in building these systems, the, the newest technology is the least well-proven technology, but it's the lowest fundamental cost. But if with the newest technology, lenders are concerned that it may not, the, the insurance policy for the technology drives up the cost of capital for the project. The number one thing today, given the state of our capital markets and the availability of large scale debt and other things, I think is um, there is in fact right now an amazing opportunity. Um, we could start building roughly 7,000 megawatts of wind and 7,000 megawatts of solar projects on the existing federally owned hydro transmission systems, which have all seen tr catastrophic reductions in their power output. The systems, the hydro systems that we built in the 60s on the upper Missouri, 
today are build, delivering 15% of their original design power output annually. And 85% of the power that's flowing over WAPA, the Federal Western Area Power Administration, is coal-fired power bought on purchase contracts to infill the power delivery contracts. Hoover Dam is supposed to be offline by 2017, according to that script study. Um, Glen Canyon is still delivering 30% of its design power output. Take that existing federal transmission system and have the federal government buy ele renewable electricity instead of buying coal-fired power to make up for those dam shortfalls and begin to use the dams for what they're best at, which is backing up intermittent sources of generation. Best thing about a dam is it can go from offline to full power output in about 15 seconds. Any thermal generator, because it's got to heat up, takes minutes to hours to come online. So dams are really the ideal, start treating dams as the storage batteries for PV and wind and solar thermal, and use the power of the federal purse to stop buying coal power and buy renewable power. You do that, there are plenty of bankers, when the federal government is the customer, who will lend at acceptable prices and get the cost of capital into the right place. Now, that's the short term. The longer term, you know, we've got $800 million of venture capital flowing at all these startups. They're mostly chasing technologies that were developed mostly in the United States in the 1980s. We've had an almost complete shutdown of solar thermal research in this country. And, you know, I think the next administration has really got to start looking at basic research in universities and national labs because, look, these are just the beginnings, right? There's fundamental advances in the reflectors, the receivers, all that stuff. There's, but you're right that the first issue is actually deploying what we've got because it's good enough. Time for one more. Yes, I have a question on thermal storage. Um, Obviously, there's different techniques for different technologies. So the Osra technology is a little lower temperature uh, source than, for example, solar reserve and some of the right. ones with more suns. Uh, not then uh, amenable to molten salts, for example, which is a higher temperature uh, for storage. Could that not be, could instead it not be stored as basically hot fluid uh, that can be flashed, uh, much in the same way that uh, uh, geothermal power plants down in the Imperial Valley of California uh, do now uh, as a means of uh, storing thermal energy at the temperatures of the linear Fresnel concentrator. So that's exactly what uh, the PS10 system does today. So in fact, um, at, at around these temperatures, that's a very reasonable approach. As you know, the, the steam pressure rises rapidly with temperature, and so the cost of the tank starts to rise. But that trade-off of steam storage, storage in molten salt, storage in solids, I, you know, there are lots of folks exploring that. Yeah, but I, it, absolutely, it's an option. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you.